Okay, so thanks. Um, so these are some remarks um, following up the discussions that we had at the uh, at the symposium um, on January 11th and 12th, where we got a number of uh, questions. And of course, as a part of the, the development of the prudent risk management approach to uh, monetary policy, the idea is to have a symposium every year uh, in January that um, that obviously uh, develops the framework further in light of comments that we received at the previous year's uh, symposium and so on. So uh, so one of the comments <clears throat> uh, that we received in uh, one of the sessions was a more general question about how does one evaluate uh, central bank monetary policy frameworks and so on. So it uh, turns out that's uh, a very uh, a difficult question and I'm not going to provide uh, a very comprehensive answer to it today, but I'm gonna try and hit um, some of the really uh, big points about uh, distinguishing between uh, FPAS central banks, um, like the Central Bank of Armenia, like the National Bank of Georgia, like the Czech National Bank, like the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Um, so these, as we're going to show now, represent a majority of central banks. Now, this is going to be in specific reference uh, to the Bank of uh, England. Um, so Ben Bernanke is is reviewing the Bank of England and and one of the uh, comments um, or the main ideas and the terms of reference is this technical assumption uh, about what you assume about the future interest rate path. That's referred to as a technical assumption. I'm going to argue it's very fundamental that it's, it's monetary policy, um, at least from the perspective of of central banks that develop forecasting and policy analysis systems. This isn't just a technical issue. This is very fundamental to how we think about monetary policy and how we communicate monetary policy. So so, the, so there's going to be some remarks uh, specifically about uh, the Bank of England uh, and, and what we think. Uh, Ben Bernanke should recommend uh, to the Bank of England. Um, I think we'll probably write up uh, some of these things. Uh, so it all starts with um, uh, the FPAS, uh, which uh, emphasizes um, economics um, in developing uh, the analytical uh, framework to support a forecast in policy analysis systems. So there's this wonderful quote uh, from Stan Fisher, who actually uh, stole it from uh, Paul Samuelson when he said, uh, I'd rather have Bob Solo than an econometric model, but I'd rather have Bob Solo with an econometric model uh, than without one. Um, and so we take the first part of the sentence, I'd rather have Bob Solo with an uh, then an econometric model. It means I don't really want models uh, that I don't have economists um, that have designed those models as well as economists that know how to use models. And so in the development of the FPAS, models are very important organizational de devices, but they're not econometric models like uh, they're thought about in a lot of central banks, um, not FPAS central banks. So, uh, so FPAS central banks, I think there's much more emphasis on, on economics when designing models, uh, making sure that those models reflect the basic principles of monetary policy that the central bank has to adjust its instruments sufficiently aggressively to provide an anchor for inflation and inflation expectations. And you have to realize that when we developed these frameworks, we did it because of experiences with the 1970s supply shocks 
where basically central banks failed to provide that anchor because they didn't adjust instruments sufficiently aggressively. And so you have to realize the entire framework has been designed so you can't solve the models with exogenous interest rate paths like we're going to show you uh, the Bank of England um, does uh, and reports uh, in their monetary policy report. So um, so what is an F-pass? Um, one representation of the model is, is, is obviously just to look at a diagram where we look at the expected path of the policy rate as being the instrument of monetary policy. So the way we thought about this 30 years ago, uh, before we developed these FPAS frameworks, this is how long this has been around. Uh, you have to realize that New Zealand adopted inflation targeting in 1990. Now, it wasn't until 1998 uh, that they had developed a forecasting and policy analysis system, but 1998, 12, uh, plus 23, that's 25 years ago, where, where central banks have already shown that this is possible. So uh, many central banks need to, especially advanced country central banks, need to learn more from the experiences of these uh, smaller central banks that have been quite successful in developing these analytical frameworks to better organize their resources inside the central bank. So the good diagram... Uh, that we have on the screen, instead of having the policy rate as being the instrument, like what we used to think about it 30 years ago, when we said little and let action speak, uh, it's uh, not just this policy rate that's completely irrelevant to most economic decision makers in the economy. For most economic decision makers like households and firms, market interest rates or longer maturity interest rates are going to be the relevant benchmark uh, that is used to uh, influence, uh, in, in this case, government bond deals, which, of course, uh, banks can hold treasuries on their, uh, on their balance sheets, and they can also hold loans, they make loans to households and to businesses. And those uh, interest rates, those longer maturity uh, interest rates, uh, they all depend on the expected path of the policy rate. So what So what policy is, this is not a technical assumption that is referred to. It is not a technical thing. This is a, a very fundamental point that I'm making about what is monetary policy. It is not setting uh, just the policy rate like people thought about it 30 years ago. It's about thinking about those fixed action dates where you do set the policy rate, using that as an opportunity to explain monetary policy to the public and to financial markets to provide some guidance to financial markets about the expected path of the policy rate, number one, and more importantly, how that expected path of the policy rate is likely to be changed in the future in response to new information. And so when one thinks about policy that way, one is trying to eliminate the uncertainty about what the central bank knows about how it's likely to react uh, to information uh, uh, by explaining to people um, action date by action date, how it's thinking about monetary policy, how it's rationalizing what it's doing with the actual uh, very short-term policy rate and how it's thinking about the expected path is evolving over time. So on the left-hand side, we obviously have the expected path of the policy rate. And on the right-hand side, we have the ultimate objective of monetary policy, which is price stability or low inflation as it's typically defined. And of course, the output gap or so the job is to anchor long-term inflation expectations but to also efficiently manage the output inflation trade-off so in the chart we can see that the expected path 
in our simple characterization of the monetary transmission mechanism influences the longer term interest rates uh, that that households and businesses uh, use to make uh, their decisions about purchasing uh, durables or or business decisions about how much to invest. Also, there's all, a very, very important part of the transmission mechanism that's related to the exchange rate, because that exchange rate is also uh, going to be affected by the expected path of the policy rate. So in an open economy, we have these expectations of the future interest rate being very important variables that influence the uh, the first direct channel monetary policy uh, market interest rates of longer maturity and the exchange rate. And of course, these variables determine financial conditions in the economy that affect the difference between aggregate demand and aggregate supply, which is what we call the output gap. Now, there's a very important role of expectations, which are uh, fundamental, uh, that need to be modeled. Um, and so that's another uh, thing that uh, central banks that have developed FPAS frameworks have to know how to flesh out this model or analytical framework in terms of codifying it on the computer and so on. And of course, all these transmission channels between these various um, parts of the transmission mechanism are uncertain. And so uh, part of the uh, the next generation of FPAS central banks, like FPAS Mark II here at the Central Bank of Armenia, is to really focus on uncertainty, um, uncertainty about uh, the transmission channel, uncertainty about the shocks uh, that are affecting the economy that are that are characterized at the at the bottom of this slide. So one can also when one looks at at state of the art forecast forecasting and policy analysis systems, uh, their forward looking frameworks uh, really can be thought of as addressing three fundamental questions. First, where is the economy today? Second, what are the underlying forces? Those two questions are very much related uh, most of the time in the sense that the amount of excess demand conditions uh, is going to affect uh, what we think underlying inflationary pressures are. So thereby, uh, what we think underlying inflationary pressures is going to affect uh, what we think uh, measures of excess demand conditions are. So that's one example where it's uh, not a good idea. Um, this was one of the problems with FPAS. Uh, Mark I central banks is that they, they separated the resources uh, studying the uh, first uh, question. Um, and, and that's not a good idea. It's very inefficient uh, in designing uh, the new framework here at the Central Bank of Armenia. We've designed everything from scratch in a way that uh, maximizes efficiency uh, for the actual objectives that we're trying to deal with, which is to, uh, to develop the best framework uh, to support monetary uh, policy analysis, deliberations, and of course, communications to the public. So those are the first two questions uh, that are that are absolutely uh, essential. Uh, the way we teach at now, relative to how we taught at past Mark I central banks is um, make sure that you have economists that can do everything um, as opposed to specializing in one of these things and then and then dealing with a communication uh, nightmare of getting everybody to talk the same language and make everything consistent. The last and important, uh, maybe the most important, um, or you might say that they're all equally important because they're all a part of a integrated framework, is what do I need to do with my instruments to achieve my objectives? And this is where Central banks like the Bank of England fall short, um, and and that's going to give rise to um, all kinds of problems uh, when you're not 
when you don't have a framework that embodies uh, these three essential ingredients that we're going to uh, that we're going to see. Now, this is just an example. Um, I've chosen uh, the Czech National Bank, uh, and I've gone back all the way to August of 2008 to show you that this has been going on quite successfully uh, for decades. Uh, in this case, 2008 is, uh, um, you know, is, uh, let's see, 23. So this is, these simulations are 15 years old, uh, August. 2008 is just before the global financial crisis, which happened on September 15th. Okay, so so what are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at a projection uh, that was created by the Monetary Policy Department at the Czech National Bank. And it's very clear, like in the preamble of the Monetary Policy Report, that, that the staff uh, own this projection uh, and it's designed uh, to uh, give to the board uh, and to be used as a frame of reference. Okay, so this is quite a bit different than some FS uh, central banks where they think about as trying to put the policy into the line. Um, and so I want to want to explain to you how to uh, interpret uh, these charts. Uh, so in August of two thousand and eight. Uh, you have to realize the context. Uh, oil prices had reached 150 bucks uh, in July of 2008. So commodity prices were quite high. Uh, the economy was uh, chugging along pretty good. Uh, and the Czech National Bank did not have a crystal ball. It's important to emphasize that. They were just using consensus forecasts of of growth um, of their trading partners. And on the basis of that, and knowing and being quite confident that uh, some of the um, things that were driving uh, headline year inflation, year on year inflation, we're going to fall out of that year on year calculation. Um, and, and so you can see they, they actually report two measures of inflation, uh, headline inflation and this thing called the monetary policy relevant inflation. I'm not a big fan of that terminology, but but the monetary policy was meant, monetary policy relevant was meant to throw out some of these uh, items um, and so on. But the major story that I want you to look at is the chart on the bottom right hand side, which is the policy rate. And I want you to understand how, how to interpret that chart, because you can see that there's a, there's a big fan chart around it. And so I, I would say in inside FPAS central banks, uh, everybody uh, would know that a line has a zero probability of being realized in the real world. So that's the first thing is that you have to make sure that uh, people inside your central bank understand what it is they're doing. And so it's it's in some sense folly uh, uh, to actually think about policy in in trying to put it all into, into one line. So uh, a much better interpretation of what we're looking at on the screen here is that given the assumptions in the forecast, which involved the global economy slowing down, and so the Czech Republic, because it's a, a very open economy, uh, that would mean their external demand would be slowing down. And given uh, that they expected that commodity prices would soften from this peak, again, because the global economy is slowing down, that combined with some of these things that were driving the year-on-year -year inflation rate up would fall out. And so, so that's... Uh, uh, how they would uh, present to the board. And of course, it would be up to the board to decide whether or not they believe that story. Turns out they did. And they cut interest rates uh, right at the time, and musically, uh, when the ECB uh, was raising rates, uh, responding to 
uh, contemporaneously to these inflationary forces because they didn't have a forward-looking framework uh, uh, to help think about uh, these things. Now, I'll make some comments um, about the Bank of England's framework, but but to do that, I want to put it in an historical context. Um, so when central banks like the Reserve Bank of New Zealand adopted uh, inflation targeting in 1990, they had central bank independence. And so this is uh, quite different uh, in the United Kingdom because monetary policy uh, when they first adopted inflation target, it was run by the chancellor of the exchequer. And this is very important because if one looks at the empirical evidence on the importance of central bank independence, you would say, hands down, that is the most important thing uh, that increases the likelihood of success of any monetary policy uh, regime. But, uh, but it, particularly uh, inflation targeting regimes. And so the graph uh, on the right uh, is a measure of long-term inflation expectations taken from the bond market. Um, and it, it has a little line there. Uh, that little line is like May of 1997. And so if you looked at long-term inflation expectations in the, in the United Kingdom from, um, in this case, from 1995 up until May 1997. This was an inflation targeting regime that uh, didn't have central bank independence. The, the term inflation report, amusingly, uh, was taken uh, from the experiences of the Bank of England because the Bank of England used to write a report on inflation because they weren't doing monetary policy. They were just, just commenting on it, uh, commenting on, on inflation. So now that was kind of really unfortunate because the rest of the world uh, was looking at inflation targeting uh, through the eyes of what the, of what the UK was doing. And it was, you know, not uh, obviously up to, uh, what we would call uh, a state of the art because it didn't even have uh, central bank independence. So uh, when you looked at long-term inflation expectations constructed by, you know, comparing the difference between the yields on conventional bonds and index bonds, you can see long-term inflation expectations in this chart on the right were quite a bit higher than what the, uh, targeting range was that's another problem um, uh, this targeting range stuff was another kind of mistake that the early inflation targeters did but what happened um well what should have happened is that people uh at the chancellor uh at what would be the treasury looked at i presume the empirical evidence up until that point which wouldn't have been crystal clear. So I, 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 I tip my hat at them for looking at the experiences of the other uh, countries and asking, uh, could we do better? Do we need central bank independence? And they surprised markets on 19, in May of 1997 by making uh, or by giving uh, the Bank of England instrument independence. Okay, so... Uh, they had goal dependence, okay, but but luckily that goal was a point target. They abandoned the range target and went to a more well-defined point target that, that obviously could become a focal point for inflation expectations and so on. So they so they made the central bank independent. They gave them a point target for inflation, and they created the Monetary Policy Committee, and all those things would be good things, okay? And in fact, financial markets uh, gave them the benefit of the doubt on the day that 
that they announced this change is a good example of the Lucas critique. Um, the inflation premium in long-term bonds fell. You see that in the chart a little bit. Uh, but what you can also see, more importantly in the chart, is that long-term inflation expectations became anchored to the target within about nine months. Um, there was subsequent uh, research on this by Andy Levin and co-authors where they not only looked at, at um, effectively bond deals and using index bond data to break them into real and nominal. Uh, but what they found when they looked at these data at daily frequency and looked at the kind of information that would drive short-term inflation expectations, uh, it, they had anchored long-term inflation expectations in the sense that uh, it was close to the target, point target. And number two, it didn't respond uh, to information that drove short-term inflation expectations. So this is what we call uh, credibility. So credibility that that people in the bond market think that uh, the system is anchored. Long-term inflation expectations are are anchored to the target. Okay, so um, so that was you know for somebody like the, me that was pushing uh, FPAS uh, frameworks. Uh, given that the uh, Bank of England didn't have an FPAS framework, and nor does the Bank of England have an FPAS uh, framework uh, to this day, um, uh, the, the market basically gave them the benefit of the doubt. Now, what we saw about monetary policy frameworks is that they're only really tested when you have these nasty stagflationary shocks like what we saw during COVID, okay? Um, and so uh, those shocks have basically shown uh, uh, that a non-FPAS central bank like uh, the Bank of England, uh, those weaknesses of not developing uh, forecasting and policy analysis system as I, as I kind of uh, summarized earlier uh, is resulting in problems. Um, and these problems obviously need to be uh, taken care of. We're hoping that uh, that the review of uh, Ben Bernanke, uh, that he communicates very clearly, this is not a technical assumption. It's, it's more than that. It's fundamentally about what is monetary policy. And until you understand what is monetary policy, it's impossible to communicate monetary policy, which means it's impossible to be accountable because accountability uh, is related to very high levels of, of monetary policy transparency. On the left-hand side, uh, you can see a measure of uh, inflation expectations based on, on the same uh, types of data, uh, data that compares the rates of return on index bonds and conventional bonds. And you can see that long-term inflation expectations um, is back up uh, to pretty high levels. Now, another aspect, um, a marker for a non-FS central bank is there will be tons of elevator economics throughout the entire report. It will just be elevator economics after elevator economics after elevator economics because you can't answer unless it's organized to answer the three essential ingredients, what do I need to do with my instruments to achieve my objectives? If you can't answer that question, the story is always going to be incomplete. Um, and, and so when you talk about presenting material, it's going to have elevator economics all over it. In this case, uh, the title is, but the text will be similar uh, all over the, the Bank of England's monetary policy report. A measure of medium-term inflation expectations in financial markets has been drifting up since the start of the year. So um, uh, that is elevator economics. That is not up to the standards that you would expect a uh, central bank that was using uh, its resources uh, wisely by investing in a 
you know, in a forecasting and policy analysis system that, you know, that address, that answer those three essential ingredients. I would say the, the uh, you know, this isn't the, the monetary policy report today. This was the uh, previous one. But in, in my mind, uh, the two most uh, important variables in the whole report uh, are the ones that I'm showing you now. And this next one is service price inflation. Uh, we prefer non-traded sticky price inflation. Uh, uh, you can read our papers about this. So uh, this service price inflation is a poor man's uh, a version of of what a really good one would be, which is uh, which is a which is non-traded. So distinguishing between traded and non-traded, like Rudy Dornbush taught us in his 1976 uh, overshooting paper that if we're going to understand the monetary policy transmission mechanism and the important role of the exchange rate, we need to distinguish between uh, traded goods prices and non-traded goods prices. It's not a question of, 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 of trying to design an inflation measure that uh, uh, where we throw out a bunch of crazy noise. It's a question of having the concepts up to the standards of economics that we need to have them up to, to think about the monetary transmission mechanism. Uh, we like as well to look at the difference between prices that are set infrequently versus prices that are set frequently. So distinguishing between those two things really helps us to think about the economics, about what's driving uh, what we call flexible prices in the economy versus stickier prices that are that are set infrequently. So non-traded sticky prices where to go, but this is the best thing in the in the monetary policy report of the UK. Again, title elevator economics, a measure of underlying services inflation has started to fall back slightly. Well, we read a computer program that could say that. Uh, uh, we don't need so this is this is not the level of economics that we want. And of course, you see a line, um, and you can see that that line is around a seven percent. So the question is, how the heck uh, is inflation going to return uh, back to the target uh, with service price inflation hanging in there at at seven percent? This is another thing, which is how much does monetary policy actually cost? at the Bank of England. And obviously when your uh, framework uh, is not well organized, there'll be incredible central bank inefficiency. And so when we just look at the line here and just use their uh, classification system, we see monetary analysis and the MPC is is 41 million pounds. Okay, now, now there are surely some other things in here like research data and analytics, 30 million pounds so when, if we look at these smaller central banks that they should be learning from they are doing it at a fraction of the cost and they're doing it right <laughs> so uh, not having an fs results in extremely low levels of central bank efficiency so um so that kind of gives you a, a nutshell of uh of how to evaluate uh, central bank and how to distinguish between an FPAS central bank versus a non-FPAS central bank. Uh, central Bank of Chile uh, is an FPAS uh, central bank. Um, and they asked me before I uh, retired from the IMF in 2018 uh, to basically uh, do an analysis, an evaluation of their framework and so on. So you can just uh, if you're interested in how you get into the uh, the details uh, and dig into all the details uh, in a central bank about about how they uh, have developed, you know, an analytical framework uh, with various tools, including you know their core projection model and and satellite models, as well as importantly, I would say even more important than the models themselves, the process for how the central bank organizes all of its surveillance and then uses models as an organizational device, as opposed to some guy uh, going off and 
estimate the model and tell you what the answer is, which is, I think, uh, at least according to the reports, where, uh, where the chief economist of the Bank of England is reporting to the Treasury, uh, it sounds like that's what they're doing. They blame it on the models, that the models were estimated over a period of time where the system was anchored. So uh, this is a no-no. Uh, if that uh, if that is actually what's going on, that's very uh, problematic. Uh, partly related to the development of uh, FPAS frameworks, because the whole idea is that you give the central bank independence. And then of course, you have to hold the central bank accountable and the only way to hold the central bank accountable is to have very high levels of monetary policy transparency. So this is some work uh, that is managed by Asya Kastanian, the latest version of the paper that basically updates these various measures of transparency uh, is uh, some joint work, work with, uh, with Jose uh, from the Central Bank of Colombia. So what's different about this um, measure of transparency and, uh, you know, relative to Denser and Eichengreen? Well, the first thing is Denser uh, was a co-author. And one of the things that she recommended we were talking about doing this is to make sure that we had a theoretical framework um, uh, to design the survey questions. And so the theoretical framework, obviously, that we uh, used was based on what we consider to be best practices in central banks that were adopting flexible inflation targeting. In other words, um, uh, not um, central banks that were inflation nutters, but central banks that recognized, maybe didn't have an explicit dual mandate, but recognized that that failing to act in a way where you cared about the real economy, failing to do that would result in massive instability in the real economy. That's why the Reserve Bank of New Zealand invited me to the Reserve Bank of New Zealand because uh, if you read the paper by Cameron Hayworth and Asia Kostanin and I, they had problems uh, uh, implementing inflation targeting in the early days because because they were uh, thinking about it like an inflation netter, and that resulted in, in, in bad things, uh, instability. Uh, a couple episodes where uh, the exchange rate appreciated, had to appreciate to keep inflation in this narrow band, and that obviously uh, resulted in uh, in a lot of costs on the traded goods sector, uh, and of course, in a parliamentary democracy like uh, New Zealand. Uh, that where people were hurting, there was also screaming. And so they they changed the framework and they developed the forecasting and policy analysis system. So you can read about this. Um, I think the last version of it uh, was actually published in a working paper by the, uh, by the Central Bank of Armenia. And so uh, just in a nutshell on the slide, uh, there's... The survey is broken into three parts. Transparency about objectives, transparency about the policymaking process, and then transparency about the app pass, which is which is vital. These are just um, the estimates um, where we've now compared uh, app pass central banks like the Central Bank of Chile, uh, the Czech Republic, Sweden, New Zealand, Colombia, Georgia, Canada, Armenia, these are all uh, FPAS central banks. So obviously they're getting scores for having an FPAS and, and all the things that an FPAS allow a central bank to have. And, and obviously the non-FPAS central banks like, like the, uh, uh, the Bank of England um, don't score very well. Uh, now let's talk just a little bit um, about what the issues are. Like, how do we classify a, 
a central bank as an FPAS central bank versus a non-FPAS central bank. So an FPAS central bank, again, addresses the three essential ingredients. Where is the economy today? What are the underlying forces? What do I need to do with my instruments to achieve my objectives? It's that way because the idea is that one wants to have an analytical framework where you can't do what's on the screen right now. So under an FPAS central bank, this is illegal, okay? Um, you can't uh, on the, on for example, the, uh, the right-hand side, which is the one where it's maybe a little bit easier for most people to understand what the issue is. So this is a forecast of that's published in the Bank of England's monetary policy report that's based on a constant interest rate. Um, now, I, I forget the exact number. It was like 2% or 3%. It was kind of like the early days of, of uh, COVID. And so, that, but the idea is that if, um, like Irving Fisher talked about this, um, there are a lot of people that, that talked about why this is illegal. Milton Friedman talked about it in his 1968 uh, presidential address that central banks can't peg interest rates. Um, uh, if they tried to do that, if they tried to fix the interest rate, and if the inflationary forces got up into, in this case, double digit uh, levels, that would drive the real interest rate down and that would make the inflationary forces even more. So uh, th this just simply doesn't make any sense. Now, unfortunately, um, the one on the right and the one on the left is market interest rates. It's worse. <laughs> it's worse because it gives the impression that is sensible when it's it's even worse uh, than than this one on the right because the right one on the right is complete nonsense. The one on the left looks like it somehow is plausible, and that's bad uh, because of the the interpretation of what Bernanke's doing, which is dealing with this technical assumption of dealing with the forecast. So it's bad in the sense that if people buy that, if people buy that, don't realize that this is fundamentally a problem with monetary policy and how you think about monetary policy, that you can have exogenous interest rates, that interest rates in the real world have to adjust sufficiently aggressively to anchor inflation and inflation expectations. Or if we were to put this uh, in, uh, in the lingo of modern monetary models, the model shouldn't be stable based on exogenous interest rates because if you could solve a model with exogenous interest rates, it means that that model would not have the fundamental principle of monetary policy in it. Okay, so that uh, that is uh, is 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 really uh, important. I'm I'm just going to now uh, end uh, by basically providing. Uh, basic summary of non-FPAS central banks versus versus the FPAS central banks like the Czech Republic and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. We refer to those central banks as as Mark I central banks. Um, we think of four key uh, characteristics uh, of all these central banks. One is, do they have the three essential ingredients? And non-FPAS central banks, obviously, is no. Uh, FPAS Mark I central banks, like, for example, the Czech National Bank, when I went through their forecast of August 2008, they do. Because they ask, where is the economy today? What are the underlying forces? And what do I need to do with my instruments? Again, not the, just the policy rate, but, but, but the expected path. And so you can see they get a check mark there. Uh, the big problem with these FPAS central banks and the reason why we need to, you know, extend them are related to the, all the lessons we learned uh, from COVID. Uh, and I would also include the global financial crisis. So how do we deal with uncertainty? And uh, I'm not going to uh, dwell on that. You can uh, 
go to the proceedings of the symposium and and listen to people like uh, Larry Summers talk about uh, the benefits of what we call f pass mark 2 which tries to deal better with uncertainty and non-linearities and so on. Um, the other thing is least regrets policies, which again uh, can only really uh, be understood by by trying to think about uncertainty and non-linearity. So non-linearities give rise to uh, what Olivier Blanchard refers to as potential dark corners. Uh, for monetary policy, what is that? What are dark corners? Uh, well, one dark corner uh, is the one that we're experiencing now where uh, long-term inflation expectations uh, could potentially ratchet up. Um, the inflation psychology uh, could take hold uh, in wage and price setters. So, uh, so one of the dark quarters is avoiding the 1970s style of, of getting hit with stagflationary shocks and not having adequate frameworks to deal with the implications of that. And you fall behind shifts in the curve. The other one, of course, is what the euro area was facing before COVID uh, because long-term inflation expectations there was were too low. Uh, they got stuck at, at one and a half. And that, of course, uh, exposed them uh, to situations where they might hit by another uh, uh, dark corner. Uh, what most monetary economists fear the most, which is a deflationary kind of spiral or a low inflation trap like what Japan got itself into. And then accountability and transparency, well, you have virtually none if you have a no F past central bank because it's all discretion and so on. Uh, so at least there was, you know, arguably some uh, accountability in, in F past Mark I central bank. So um, I'm not going to um, go much uh, further now uh, but only to say that that obviously we've been listening uh, to uh, many of the comments that that people like uh, Larry Summers has been making uh, critical comments and try to think hard about how would we uh, take those comments and extend uh, these FBAS Markman central banks to incorporate uncertainty and uh, nonlinearity. So I think I will uh, I will leave it there, uh, call it a day. Uh, that was not a very uh, comprehensive um, analysis about how you, one evaluates uh, central banks, but I think it kind of tells you the uh, the key points about about how you uh, um, decide whether or not uh, one is. Uh, like a non-FS central bank, like the Bank of England versus uh, central banks that have been vested in developing forward-looking frameworks like the uh, central banks that I mentioned. So uh, I guess we could um, have a question um, or we can simply wrap, wrap it up and, and, uh, and call it a day. I have potentially a question. Okay. Yes. <laughs> My son um, Jared Lax is going to ask me a question. Okay. Go yeah, yeah. It's a very it's a very practical question um, because I'm involved in in writing the NPR, um, and so maybe if you go back to the service price inflation for for the UK NPR. Mm -hmm. So. so would your and you say that it's it's inadequate because it just tells you um about how things have where we are today essentially um so would your idea be that the notes that we need to be putting on these graphs uh throughout the npr should essentially be talking about all three ingredients uh to the f pass is that so and so there would be some repetition there i guess but i guess the the question is how would you annotate this this graph better well the first thing is that i wouldn't like it it has some sort of forecast like that shaded area looks like it's 
forecast. So that that would be a no no under under any. I can't think of any reason for doing that in any situation. But no, I would say not all of the variables would have to have lines. Um, some of the variables could be uh, motivation and so on. Like, for example, uh, lots of high frequency data, you're not going to have a forecast for every series that, you know, that goes into it. But something as important as service price inflation, given that they don't have non-traded <laughs> sticky price, you know, this, this to me is, you know, when, when I look at the, at the Bank of England's monetary policy report, this is the first variable I look at. Uh, this and wages uh, to ask, you know, what are underlying, you know, inflationary pressures in the economy. So, um, so that would be, uh, you know, that would be my response. So, would you would you comment on the implications for policy here? Is is maybe my question on that third ingredient because. Also, if you look at the latest vote by the MPC that happened today, right? So there was a two members that voted for increases, six members that voted for no change, and one voter that uh, voted for um, for decrease. And so you can imagine, you know, is the voice perhaps of the board members who voted for increases are like you? They're they're looking specifically at this this chart and that's what's the main motivation for yeah. for uh for why they voted in that way and yeah. so it would be a good opportunity perhaps to write here um the implications for policy so that people can draw a line to these differences in opinions maybe yeah but then okay um uh, this is a complicated question i'm not gonna like depends on the design of the entire monetary policy report, right? So, uh, right. I don't want to do we, wanna do we make save detailed, it detail comments until you know I'd have to understand are we you know are we going for a, a fifteen pager? You know, are we going for a, a fifty pager? Um, and so I'd want to be very careful about making comments about a monetary policy report without knowing precisely what goes into the entire report okay so okay uh okay so i think what we'll do is any other okay so i think what we'll do is call it a day um it's been a long day here and so i think i'm gonna wrap it up there and uh and, and move on